Good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's training session on how to cover COVID-19. I want to thank all the journalists for participating. I'm sure we're going to have a wonderful and very enlightening session. But before we begin with the training aspect, I want to introduce you to one of the leaders of the US, of the US mission here in Nigeria. Our deputy chief of mission, Kathleen Fitzgibbon, is joining us to deliver some opening remarks. To give you just a little bit of background about her, she has been the deputy chief of mission since June of 2019. In this capacity, she assists the ambassador in leading the nearly 1,000 American and Nigerian employees in Abuja and Lagos to advance U.S. strategic goals in security cooperation, democracy and governance, economic growth and trade, and development and humanitarian assistance. She has spent 11 years in various assignments in Africa, including Sierra Leone, where she was the Deputy Chief of Mission and served as Charge d'Affaires. She was a key player in the international response efforts against Ebola, which I think makes her particularly qualified to help in the program that we're doing today. She has also served in Gabon, Uganda, Chad, and as the political chief here in Lagos. Through these and her Washington assignments, she has built up expertise on human trafficking, conflict resolution, refugee affairs, human rights, dem democratic and economic reforms, commercial advocacy, and health diplomacy. Before joining the Department of State, she taught African politics and international development in American government at Mary Washington College in Fred Fredericksburg, Virginia. She holds a BA in political science from Harvard College in New York and has a master's in international relations from the University of California at Davis. So, ma'am, welcome to our program. Thank you, Russell, and thank you, sir, for letting me join your um, program. The reason I really care about this is because I felt in the epidemic uh, in Sierra Leone that the press played such a critical role. Um, I just want to give you a little bit of uh, information about what the U.S. government is doing before I talk about your role. Um, you should know there are 55 health experts from the United States government that are uh, members of our U.S. Centers for Disease Control, U.S. Agency for International Development, and Walter Reed Army Hospital that are in the middle of this response providing expertise at the state and federal level um, uh, to fight COVID. We've already provided $44.4 million across the response pillars, and you need to become familiar with those. The pillars are epidemiology and surveillance, laboratory, infection control and prevention, case management, risk communications and social engagement, security logistics and mass care, point of entry, research and command and control. The reason why you need to know about these uh, pillars is because that is how, that is the internal structure of how the response uh, is working at the state level and federal level. You'll get more on that probably in the next session. But what I wanted to tell you about is that my experience shows that the journalists that I worked with in media were critical for conveying information and serving as the recorders of history in this pandemic. So as you're reporting, don't think of every report as a one-off report. Think about the body of work that you and your uh, media house want to put forward? What is the role you want to play? And you can also play many roles. Um, as the feedback mechanism for the response, so you actually the reports that you provide, we read every day to figure out whether or not our interventions are working. So you are playing a critical role of feedback mechanism. Um, you're helping convey information to the public. Um, you're showing us what works, what doesn't work, um, and also the areas for improvement because of your on the ground investigations. The response can't be everywhere, but you are. So you have so many roles to play as you uh, take in information and figure out um, how to analyze it and put it into uh, good, good journalism. So through the use of print, visual and audio media, the stories that you convey are the essential link to inform people throughout the country and frankly throughout the world on what's happening. Uh, your ability to report and in local languages is also critical to reach folks um, outside the main media hubs. As you know, um, not everybody uh, has internet and not everybody has television. So there's many ways that uh, your, your work is helping to transmit messaging 
and conveying messaging back. Um, what you find right now in this epidemic, just like we did in Sierra Leone, is fake news. It is so pernicious. And in Sierra Leone, I'm gonna give you an example of, of uh, fake news that actually killed people, okay? A prominent pastor said that Ebola could be prevented and cured by washing with salt water. Many people decided not to take the precautions the government was, re was recommending and instead washed with salt water. Many people got Ebola and many people died. But it was the press that helped us turn that fake narrative around by reporting on people that died from following the fake news. Um, and so in this way, the press in Sierra Leone helped save lives. So remember that as you're reporting and as you're um, synthesizing information, uh, that you have a, a role that I think is underplayed for the media. A lot of folks want to criticize media for being too critical or sensational, but sometimes it's those kind of reports that actually help save lives as long as you are reporting the truth. So I really commend you for what you're going to be doing probably for the next year is, and you need to look at this as a long-term effort. It's not going to be a short-term um, this is over in a few months pandemic. This is actually, as you see from the rest of the world, taking on a life of its own and it kind of reinfects itself and we keep going. So that's your collective role as the media, your individual role. What I found in Sierra Leone is the individuals, the stories you as individual reporters tell and told about what the human uh, impact of the disease was or impact of restrictions are, and you've already seen that when uh, the government's had to make a lot of decisions based on the type of reporting you've done. Uh, because if you can show what the impact is of a certain measure, then the, the people making decisions can decide how to fix that. So that's your, your, whether or not you think you're helping the government, you actually are. So um, I hope these sessions will help open your horizons as to the types of um, the fake news, dealing with fake news or how to manage medical information or how to find sources, those things are going to enrich your reporting and enrich our ability to help defeat the disease. So you actually are a disease fighter yourself through your reporting. You don't have to be a medical provider to do that. You actually are doing it. So just quickly on some of your challenges, um, Nigeria is a challenging environment, as you know. It's, we have a highly polarized political environment. Uh, there are extremes in terms of the levels of education of your audiences, too much information, conspiracies, fake news, travel, travel restrictions and social distancing makes it uh, difficult for you to uh, actually meet people in person, but this is where your uh, creativity has to step up um, and open different types of communication channels just like we're using now through um, uh, social media. So the other challenge that you have and that we have is unlike Ebola, which was, Ebola was a deadly disease. But Ebola lived by very rigid rules and it never went outside the rules. Um, we knew uh, exactly what the incubation period was. We knew that if you were asymptomatic, symptomatic, you couldn't transmit. Uh, we knew, and it was not airborne. So therefore, if you didn't touch anybody, you couldn't get Ebola. That's not the case right now. You have an unpredictable disease. And why that's a challenge for you as journalists, and it's a challenge for the government response is that the recommendations that are made seem to change on a daily basis. I see all of you holding the government accountable at the PTF briefings every day. And I can tell you from their responses that actually they, they struggle internally, just like we do on the US government side as to what are the right recommendations to make to our people. Um, so this is a fast paced, evolving pandemic. We're learning a lot in Nigeria from things that have happened in other countries. So I would just argue that if you can be as flexible as you can and not necessarily hold on to things and think that they're, they're a lie or they're not, they're a falsehood. If you can understand that everyone is making the best decisions on the information they have at hand. So understanding that base of information, which Sarah is also going to be talking about will help you better uh, figure out uh, which, uh, what role you can play, but also uh, with a deep, contact base, you can determine whether or not something is true or false, right? You need to have a lot of sources to figure out how did that decision get made to lift restrictions or how did that decision get made to lock down a certain area. Okay, finally, I just want to give you a little bit of advice and then I'll be quiet. Um, as this pandemic moves on, you need to understand the phases of the pandemic. Okay, you first have the arrival of the disease. 
And then you have, we had the lockdown. Well, now we're in a phase because at that phase of the pandemic, we were trying to control it and try to stamp it out like a fire before it got out. Well, now you need to think that the wildfire is out. We are in what's called exponential growth. And you'll learn more about that in one of the next sessions. Um, that means that the numbers of cases are increasing um, at increasing rates every single day. So you need to expect that the case loads, the case counts, especially when we have more and more testing coming online, which is happening now as well, the numbers are gonna to continue to grow significantly. Actually, you will be alarmed at how they're gonna be growing. Um, so when you think about that, in this phase of community transmission and exponential growth, the government's actions during this phase are gonna be different than ones they took before. So just keep that in mind. Um, finally, the most important thing I think you can do is present stories that will help shape the response, just as some of the ones about lockdowns did. Um, but also be careful about uh, understanding your role of informing people about what they should be doing. And I think when you put the human face on the pandemic, it's going to have a lasting impact on Nigeria's um, collective experience during this disease. Because regardless of where you are in the country, Southwest, North, Southeast, regardless of your religion, this disease doesn't care. And what we need to do is make sure that everybody uh, understands the disease is real and that behavior change will win the battle and that the collective actions across the country, individual actions in a collective way across the country will win the day. This is gonna be a long haul. You're gonna have a lot to report on I want you to think about your, um, what you want your body of work to reflect and how you want to reflect uh, in history, in the historic record, what happened here in Nigeria. So you are so vital to this fight. So I just want to let you know my final comment is, is remember that every single day you are reporting, you are helping translate the science of this disease to society. There's no better way to do that than use our journalists uh, who have on the ground language skills, who understand people and behavior change. But that scientific, you know, everybody can hear about science, but it, until it actually hits them, they don't really understand it. So that translation role you're playing is critical. And I'm so grateful for Russell and for um, Sarah to bring you uh, some of the tools that you can use to, to play that role. We've also brought along Halilu Usman from CDC, who will be maybe making a few comments a little bit later. Um, uh, as one of our communications experts, uh, and we're going to be able to give you some other contacts. So thank you again, Russell, and thank you everybody for um, helping us in the fight against COVID. Thanks. Thank you very much. Now it's going to be my pleasure to introduce you to the facilitator. Yes, I neglected to formally introduce myself. So my name is Russell Brooks, the public affairs officer here in Lagos. And uh, uh, again, it's my pleasure to uh, welcome all of our journalists. Now, Sarah is a Paris-based journalist and trainer. She regularly trains for Africa Regional Services. That is the U.S. State Department office in Paris that uh, coordinates a lot of the training and programs that we do on the continent, both for Francophone as well as English-speaking posts. She, in fact, recently conducted a session on reporting on Ebola in Rwanda and the Democratic Republic of the Congo. She has two specialties, health and business reporting. And her work has appeared in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, The Economist, and on BBC Newsnight. She's reported across a range of health subjects and has directed a reporting project in Liberia when the country was declared Ebola free. She holds a Master's of Science from the Graduate School of Journalism at Columbia University, which is located in New York City. So it is my pleasure to introduce you to Sarah Wachter, and she's going to commence this program. Sarah, take it away. Thank you very much, Russell. And uh, thank you to all of you who have come here uh, in, in good numbers to listen to this um, session. As you know, uh, we're going to be doing um, this session in three parts. Today, uh, we're going to be dealing with, with uh, two issues. Uh, the, the first issue we're going to talk about is how to get good sources, how to find them, uh, who are they, how can you broaden your list of sources, 
Um, I understand in Nigeria, and it's not just in Nigeria, but uh, even reporters in the US, we can get quite frustrated when we don't get um, the kind of responses we would like to our questions sometimes by, uh, by health ministries and, and sometimes by other government institutes. Uh, what can you do when you get stonewalled or you don't get satisfactory answers? Um, in the United States, probably also in the UK, we have a long um, experience of journalists who become specialists in covering health issues. It goes back more than a century, actually. Uh, so we have a large body of best practices that we've been able to in the United States now for, for a very long time. I had the great fortune of working on staff as a reporter and as an editor for a magazine called Longevity, which followed the best practices of health reporting, which also meant that for us, health reporting is a life or death matter. If you uh, get a zero wrong in a dosage uh, recommended by a doctor, it could have life or death health consequences. At Longevity Magazine, we had a whole fact-checking department that checked rigorously every fact and every quote by every medical doctor. And I'll tell you ways in which you can also put that into your reporting. So, you know, this pandemic, um, the question for Nigeria, and it's a question in every country really is, you know, where exactly are we in this pandemic? The big question in a, in a country like Nigeria is, is it at an early stage? Uh, are we gonna continue to see exponential growth? Uh, but one thing is clear, I think, until we have uh, treatments or a vaccine in place and we can distribute it worldwide, we're going to be probably living with this pandemic for, uh, for some time. Um, so I'm going to also share in this class a little bit some of my experiences uh, from my reporting in Liberia that I think could also be useful at this time. So let's uh, put up the presentation and we'll start talking about sourcing. So, you know, how do you get across, no, that's fine. How do you get across that this pandemic is real? One of the classic responses in all countries are people who want to deny that this exists. It's invisible if it's not um, in some way touching your, your personal life. Um, it's an ongoing challenge to how we make this pandemic uh, real so that people take it seriously because the only safeguards that we have against the further spread of this disease right now are public health measures, the kind of measures that can be taken on the ground by individuals, by families, by businesses, uh, in terms of wearing masks, washing hands, and all the public health measures that, that they need to take. Uh, that's the only uh, defense that, that we have right now until uh, we come up with some kind of a treatment. Uh, next slide, please. And we don't know where things are headed in Africa. Africa and Nigeria are a little bit um, later in the advance of the pandemic. For you um, and for, for our sessions together, uh, we have now amassed in the United States a body of reporting experience on the pandemic that I wanna be able to share with you. Um, some of the experiences that we've had, some of the pressure points that we've seen in our reporting, uh, and maybe share with you some possible solutions. Wh where do we stand right now? The UN Economic Commission for Africa says that, you know, um, the continent could see a loss of life to COVID-19 uh, ranging anywhere between 300,000 lives or 3.3 million lives. And as you probably know in the United States, unfortunately, um, we've lost 100,000 people to this pandemic and the numbers are uh, in certain places growing in other places going down. It's a bit of a mosaic um, in the US as it is in many countries. Uh, next slide, please. There's a few <clears throat> reporting principles I think you need to keep in mind while you're covering this, um, while you're covering this pandemic, um, which are a bit different maybe from covering other stories. <clears throat> First of all, <clears throat> and Kathleen made reference to this in, in her talk, um, there's a tremendous amount of uncertainty about just about everything concerning uh, this pandemic. Um, it's a new disease. Scientists don't understand this virus. It's a new virus. We don't understand how it spreads in populations. We don't understand why some people get very sick and others don't, although there are a few clues, but not definitive. We don't know why um, certain communities are very hard hit and others are not. Uh, everything about this pandemic, 
uh, even in terms of public health measures, you know, what measures work better than others. Uh, we don't understand, you know, and there's research going on all the time that is refining in um, our understanding of many things. For example, um, how well do masks work? How do masks work? Um, in what situations should we use masks? New research is coming all the time on that. Uh, so it's a really fast evolving story. I probably, because of this course, which I am doing for a number of embassies uh, for the US, I am reading three, three to four hours a day just to keep myself up on the very latest research on all the different aspects of the, of the disease. Uh, so it's a very fast evolving story. Uh, nothing is completely certain. So as Kathleen said, you got to be a little bit uh, flexible in your attitudes and in your reporting. Uh, and also is something that is always a reporting principle for us in the US, but I think is even more important in medical journalism. When you start seeing these reports in social media and elsewhere talking about uh, the origins of the virus or potential cures or medical researches, you need to really uh, stay skeptical until you have all the evidence in front of you to know exactly what we do know and what we don't know about a potential treatment, a potential cure, a possible origin of the virus, et cetera, because it's so fast evolving. But you need to get that hard data on what, what do we know and what don't we know. And in fact, a lot of the reporting uh, examples that I'll show you in this course actually spells out to people, this is what we know, and this is what we're not certain about. And I think that's one of the ways to handle uh, the uncertainty, which we're going to face for, for some time. Uh, next slide, please. So why, why be skeptical? Why is skepticism so important? Um, and this is, of course, something especially important when you are being probably avalanched with all kinds of uh, fake news and disinformation about, you know, sunlight can, can protect you from the virus or, or who knows what. It, it, you need to keep in mind that the earliest that scientists were able to ever create a vaccine was four years. It took four years to create a vaccine uh, for measles. Uh, and that was the fastest. Now, of course, today we're in the 21st century and we are talking about an enormous global effort behind the search for a vaccine or treatment. So perhaps it could be sped up, but you need to keep that in mind. It's not so easy to come up with a, with a vaccine. And, and remember also that uh, HIV AIDS, they have never found a vaccine for that. We are still living with a treatment cocktail, which is the only thing they've come up with to try to uh, expand, you know, prolong the lives of people who have HIV AIDS. But that's, that's all they've ever been able to discover. Of course, today, Today, there are more than 100 different research teams that are working on a, on a vaccine. And in parallel, um, the other area of inquiry is looking at some kind of a treatment cocktail. Because if we don't find a vaccine, you know, maybe there's a treatment cocktail that'll work, that will work. Some of the work that's going on is looking at um, different types of antivirals, anti-inflammatories, and immunosuppressant medications, and the combination of some of the um, medications that we already have. And it, you also need to keep in mind that this is a global pandemic. We are talking about, we need a vaccine for potentially 8 billion people on the planet. And that's a scale that we've, we've never dealt with uh, before. And there are all kinds of issues of how are we gonna be able actually to produce enough of a vaccine. And now many of the experts in vaccines are saying, we're gonna need several vaccines to meet the global demand. It's not gonna just be one, it would have to be several. And there's so many supply issues. Even do we have enough glass for the vials to distribute a vaccine? Do we have a supply chain in place to distribute it to the very last mile in, uh, in, in villages which are very much off the grid. I mean, how are we going to actually deal with all these issues? So you need to be very skeptical when you start hearing people because this pandemic is being politicized in, in certain corners uh, in, in many countries uh, because people are afraid, they're panicking, and sometimes uh, religious leaders, community leaders, business leaders, and politicians, members of the opposition are using this to try to peddle some sort of false hope to, uh, to populations. And don't be caught in by that. The, the, the research which will be needed to 
find a potential vaccine or several vaccines or treatment cocktail uh, for, for that matter, it's going to require a lot of research to verify and re-verify the information, make sure it's safe, make sure there aren't a lot of devastating side effects. This, despite the fact that you know, it's incredibly urgent that we find a cure, uh, if, we, if a cure can be found, as I said, uh, this is going to take a lot of work. It's not one research study which is going to determine a potential vaccine. It will have to be re-verified and re-verified in many populations and many different kinds of studies before we're sure that this is something that can work. And even if we do find a vaccine, how long will it last? How often will we need to take it? Will it last forever, which is probably highly unlikely? Uh, it could it last three months. Would we need to have a booster shot every year? Uh, these are so many issues that will uh, come under consideration with a potential vaccine. Next slide, please. So how do you go about finding sources uh, to do your health reporting? Um, I take a very conservative stance and I'm going to strongly encourage you to do the same thing. You should really only rely on medical professionals, research professionals with very deep expertise at respected in institutions, whether in Nigeria, uh, Africa-wide, or uh, on, a, on a global level. Um, the problem that you need to understand, and there's been several incidences of these recently, is that because of the ability to uh, use social media to spread disinformation, um, scientists who have been discredited for doing bad work or who are very provocative in their work or don't design their research, research very well, unfortunately are able to use the, to the tools of social media to get credence because once something is spread widely through the internet, people start to believe it because the average citizen is not good at asking the question of what is the source of this information. So uh, I'm going to say to you, and we're going to go through some different alternate sources to just uh, you know, your traditional sources of, of the health ministry in, in Nigeria and related institutions, that you rely on professionals with very deep expertise at respected institutions. Uh, if you identify, for example, a doctor who's saying some very interesting things uh, in his or her Twitter handle about COVID, you need to actually go back to the institutional website, check out who this person is, see if they have deep research on this topic, how many papers have they published, um, even you know, talking to the press department, getting as much information as you can to make sure that this is actually a solid expert with really deep experience uh, on a particular topic that he or she is talking about. There is a lot of rogue information which is swirling out there. Next slide. So uh, the classic example, and this is just a warning, and I'm actually gonna send you a little piece of um, homework to, to look at at the end of the session, uh, is this whole controversy over hydroxychloroquine. Uh, which is widely used against malaria. And of course, there was a study that was done in France, uh, which was very small and apparently wasn't very well designed in terms of best scientific practices. All of a sudden, uh, took off like a flame on the internet and lots of governments who are looking for you know, an affordable solution for populations started looking at this uh, treatment seriously. Um, after that, there was a larger, well-designed piece of research that was published in probably the most respected medical journal for research called The Lancet, uh, showed that actually this drug could, could increase the risk of death. Uh, but after that, you know, 100 scientists actually criticized the study that was published in The Lancet. Um, and at the same time, uh, last week, the World Health Organization said, well, actually, we're stopping any clinical trials on these drugs. This is just to show you uh, that science, scientists right now, we're at the very early stages of understanding this, this disease and studying treatments for it. Uh, we don't have a scientific consensus yet. Um, all that we can do as health reporters is to present, prevent all the information, the best available information from the best researchers with the deepest experience um, so that we provide um, the whole range of, of views on it. And, whether or not there's a consensus or not. I'm gonna show you a very good article that I think actually does a very good, jo good job of this. Um, I think it could provide good for you to use a um, one 
communications uh, and, and sort of flow to that you can follow in terms of the kinds of um, uh, solutions that are out there. Next slide, please. So, you know, just a reminder for you, you know, reporting on health has got you know, life or death consequences. And, you know, any mistake that, that you make, even the smallest mistake uh, can, can be fatal. If, uh, if you have interviewed a doctor about a potential treatment who's staying at, at this dosage level, it deadline can have consequences. So, you know, make sure you check your facts and your numbers at least twice, if not three times. Also, say to you that on research matters, what we really use uh, for the sake of accuracy and clarity is we will send an entire story that we're doing on, on a potential treatment, for example, um, to the doctors that we have interviewed saying, Could you please look at this for the sake of accuracy and clarity and make sure that we have correctly what it is that you've said? and the state of, of research today. Uh, you're not giving it to them because you sense what you're saying. Remember that you are 100% back you up. That's another way to make sure that the reports that you're doing are clear and everything has been verified and you've had doctors take a look at it. As we call it in the US, it's very good to have a, a second set of eyes on this, this kind of information. Next slide, please. So what kinds of experts are the most important type of medical expert to be viewing on a regular basis during this pandemic? Um, the top of the story at, at this moment, um, before you start talking about uh, research and cures, uh, the first one, of course, is having a list of good health statisticians. Data is a very important part of this uh, story. Uh, we're going to talk about understanding health statistics uh, in our together. But you want statisticians who can actually provide you with an understanding of what these statistics mean. I'm going to walk you through some of the most common statistics that, uh, that you have and that you get from, from the government or from other sources. And we'll talk about other sources of health statistics as well. Uh, but you need people to actually explain and unpack um, these statistics and what they mean. Uh, epidemiolo epidemiologists also, epidemiologists are responsible for actually tracking the pattern of the spread um, of, of a disease, uh, looking at the statistics as well. And then, you know, another part of the story is um, clinical experience. Uh, what's happening on the ground? You also need to build up um, a resource of doctors, nurses, and other healthcare workers who are at the front lines of, of this disease, working in treatment centers, working in emergency rooms in, in hospitals, treating uh, COVID-19 patients. Because understanding this pandemic is a combination of the research going on in laboratories, as well as building up a body of evidence uh, from the clinical understanding that's building globally in hospitals and treatment centers. And, you know, even at this stage, we really don't know uh, whether or not this disease is moving through populations differently and country to country. Uh, we, we just don't know. But for the moment, it's really good to, to understand how the disease is spreading in other countries. Of course, uh, also, you want to talk to medical researchers and academics who are studying the virus. I've given you just a, a small list of, of the kinds of people you'll be talking to biologists that study the, the, vi the virus, infectious disease specialists clinical researchers, those that take the information from what's happening in clinical settings and studying them, public health uh, specialists, data scientists, this is very much a data story, teaching hospitals, medical schools have also some, some very good information. Uh, this is a disease uh, where the immune system is also a uh, a very important part of the story. Those who have more, at least as, as our understanding is today, those who have more compromised immune systems seem to suffer uh, much more from, from the disease, from the symptoms, and on and on. Subspecialties also the disease impact. They're now discovering um, that the way the disease can also attack the vascular system. 
This is especially true also for, for children. Uh, the way the disease is attacking the lungs, pulmonologists, uh, kidney failure seems to be a part of this disease. So nephrologists are important. Cardiologists, people are also having heart failure, um, those who have extreme uh, cases of the disease. Pediatricians, because the disease is affecting children very differently than the way that's affecting adults. Bioethicists, um, talking about uh, the disease itself. So understanding this pandemic for you is to have a mix of uh, practitioners uh, in the clinical setting and, and researchers. Um, next slide, please. So, you know, as I said, you, you want to stick to those who work for the most respected institutions and firms. I'm going to share with you who these are. Who these are. <coughs> of course, um, I'm going to talk about uh, at the international level, those who have deep, deep experience in Africa and Nigeria as, as one source at the African level, and also maybe a few sources you may not have thought about uh, even in your own backyard in Nigeria, who you are familiar with, but maybe haven't had much experience doing much reporting with. And some of the most important things that are going on in Africa that concern this pandemic, people you want to reach out to. But make sure that you verify the professional background and experience at these official websites. Don't rely on a single social media um, outlet as, as, as a resource for whether or not this is a credible scientist or, or doctor on the topic. Next slide, please. So to me, this is the first line of defense beyond the health ministry and related government institutions uh, that do health briefings that, you know, release data, um, maybe not as, as timely as you would like or in, in quite the way that you need it. But there are other sources that you can go to for health data on Nigeria, for experts on Nigeria. Um, and, and the, the two most important really are is CDC Africa. There's of course CDC Nigeria, who you're gonna be speaking with uh, in, in just a little while. There's also CDC Africa. They have a whole range of experts. You can contact them, say, listen, I'm trying to build up my list of experts who are health statisticians or bioethicists. They will have some people, people who have deep experience in Nigeria. CDC Africa is a very great resource. Also the World Health Organization, Nigeria, like most countries in the world, is a member country. Um, they will have a range of a wide range of experts. You can contact them, uh, build up your portfolio of experts at the World Health Organization. They also have, interestingly, if you weren't familiar, uh, they have an African Vaccine Regulatory Forum, which could also be a very interesting resource for you. Um, on the clinical level, don't forget also global NGOs like Doctors Without Borders, who, as I understand it, are going to be ramping up their efforts in uh, working uh, in Africa. So also, they may also allow their doctors to be available who are working on this pandemic uh, for, for interviews. Uh, Oxfam's Pan-Africa program as well is another one. And of course, um, it is expensive sometimes to contact these organizations overseas, but you can make an initial uh, query to set up time to talk and you can talk to them. You know, everybody is working today uh, uh, with all these great media tools that we have. You can do your interviews on WhatsApp, FaceTime, Zoom, Skype, whichever you prefer, or Google, you know, Google Duo. There's so many of these tools out there um, to cut down on your reporting costs. But these are really the first line on an international level. You should definitely be deepening um, your contacts and your exposure with both CDC Africa and WHO when we're talking about sources outside of, uh, of Nigeria. Next slide, please. Also, uh, think about foundations that are doing do a lot of work in Africa that have experience uh, working on epidemics, pandemics. One in particular is the Gates Foundation. Uh, this, I'm giving you the name of their Africa director. They are also, as I understand it, deepening their work in Nigeria. And you may be familiar with the fact that uh, Bill Gates has become quite visible um, on this pandemic because years ago he gave a famous TED talk where he warned that the world was not prepared for a pandemic. He is also investing quite heavily in helping for the search for a vaccine. So they could also have some very interesting sources for you to talk to there. And of course, uh, the pharmaceutical companies. The pharmaceutical companies, most of them are in the US, um, a couple of them are in the UK or in Europe, but they are the main actors who are working on vaccines. So uh, don't forget about Big Pharma. They're a very important part of, uh, of this story. Uh, next slide. 
Also, um, this pandemic is a global pandemic and the best global public health uh, schools in the world, well, most of them do happen to be based in the United States. Uh, and many of them have throughout decades uh, been doing research partnerships in a country like Nigeria, have built up experience in Nigeria or in similar countries. And we'll have experts who you can talk to, researchers, clinicians, um, they have some of the best information. We're going to talk in particular in a minute about Johns Hopkins, which is a very important organization uh, in terms of statistics. Um, so, uh, you know, think about reaching out also to the press departments uh, for the global public health departments of these universities, also to find medical research. For example, University, um, which I am, you know, an alum of, I was just reading their magazine the other day, the top expert on pandemics um, at Columbia University was uh, the first person the Chinese government got in touch with when they realized that they had um, the possibility of an epidemic or a pandemic on their hands, who got on a plane immediately to go to China to consult with them on um, immediate measures that they needed to take. So there's a rich experience on epidemics and pandemics global experience and in-country Africa and Nigerian experience at these organizations. Um, next slide. I'm mentioning in particular Johns Hopkins uh, Bloomberg School of Public Health um, because they are one of the top sources on health statistics globally. They have a dashboard. We'll talk a little bit more about health statistics tomorrow, but I want to signal them because for me as a foreign correspondent, uh, when we're looking for information of health statistics uh, in this pandemic, they are considered one of the most credible resources of, of health statistics by us. Um, they also have a Nigeria country director, I give you their, their name here, who I think is also someone who you'll want to make sure and, uh, and, and get in touch with. So Johns Hopkins is, I think, probably a resource for you, a very deep and, and rich uh, resource. Next slide. A few other things to keep in mind, I think, who are also important potential sources for you. I'm just giving you the name of one in particular, but realize, as, as Kathleen said, um, there is a rich experience in the Ebola affected countries. Now, you know, Nigeria also has some very rich experience because Nigeria was very concerned in case the Ebola um, epidemic spread into Nigeria and has also, you've got some very rich experience on those people, those doctors and those researchers who worked on trying to make sure that Ebola did not uh, come en masse to Nigeria, which of course didn't happen. Um, but there are experience, uh, there are experts across the spectrum of lessons that have been learned on Ebola, which are now being deployed into this pandemic. Um, so I would say to you, reach out to experts, perhaps in Sierra Leone, in Liberia, they could be, I'm, I'm leaving you the name of Dr. Jerry Brown. He was the medical director at a hospital in, uh, in Monrovia called Eternal Love Winning, um, who's a very, who's a top expert on, uh, on what happened in, uh, in Liberia. Um, so the former heads of Ebola task, force, task forces in these countries, in your country or in other affected countries are, are also, um, some of those people are being interviewed a lot on lessons learned. Uh, so that's another in interesting um, area of sources for you. Gavi was uh, the initiative which was put together for HIV AIDS. Realized that a lot of the researchers in all uh, global health departments who had been working on HIV AIDS or had in the past been working on Ebola, maybe had been working on other diseases are now being redeployed to work on this pandemic. And they have a rich and deep experience to draw from uh, of what they learned, which they are now applying to this pandemic. So uh, these are also, I think, interesting areas where you can find other potential sources. Uh, next slide. Also, don't forget the development banks. Uh, when I went to La Liberia and did uh, seven days of reporting on the ground uh, to see how the country was trying to get back on its feet after, the, after Ebola, um, I actually went on a project that was underwritten by the African Development Bank. Um, 
I read the other day that they are now trying to raise about 10 million US dollars uh, to go uh, to fighting the pandemic in Africa. Uh, they clearly and have now expanded their offices regionally as well as um, in country. So uh, they could have some very interesting projects and, and expertise on the pandemic, as well as other development banks and agencies um, in uh, international countries realize that at this point, um, the most amount of money which is going into medical research in Africa is actually coming from uh, sources in Europe, in the United States, in Canada, is, is coming from the West. So uh, uh, don't forget also to contact some of these sources and find out what's going on in, in Nigeria. Uh, next slide. Also, there are some great sources uh, Africa-wide who are working on this pandemic uh, at the African Academy of Sciences. Uh, Dr. Moses Alobo is actually the doctor who's in charge of the COVID response committee at, uh, at the AAS. Uh, there's also the organization Scientists in Africa working on this, uh, the African Epidemiology Association. Uh, there's also an EU funded European Developing Countries Clinical Trials Partnership for COVID-19. Uh, and also NEPAD uh, with funding from Wellcome Trust, which is a very large source of medical research funding um, in the UK, is also doing some work on this pandemic. And because Nigeria is such an important country, it's one of the, it's the most populous uh, country in, in, in Africa, there are going to definitely be some projects going on, I think, in, in Nigeria. Uh, that these um, organizations will be looking at. Next slide. Um, just some ideas, some of these organizations you may be working with, others maybe not. Of course, there's the N Nigerian Institute for Medical Research. Uh, a very important part of the study on the pandemic is a lot of the work is being done uh, sequencing the gene of the coronavirus and looking for targets within the gene to, to try to figure out ways to target medications according to the aberrations in the genes. Um, so there's the African Center of Excellence for the Genomics of Infectious Disease at Redeemer University. You have in Nigeria something that many countries in Africa may not have. You have a biosafety lab for highly infectious pathogens to contact. Uh, your Nigeria CDC, uh, they're gonna be speaking in a moment. Uh, we'll tell you a little bit about uh, what they're doing. Uh, there's a private sector initiative, of course, also the Coalition Against COVID-19. Uh, then Dangote Foundation is doing some work on testing um, and also the Royal College of Pathologists. So uh, there's some also some very interesting things going on in your own backyard. Some you may be working with and some I'm just offering as, as other opportunities of other uh, potential sources locally. Next slide. So, you know, another way to just beginning, you know, Health reporting, like any new beat for any journalist, uh, it's a bit haphazard in the beginning, starting to build up a source base. Uh, but take advantage of the fact that right now, um, the major publications with the most respected uh, journalists that are covering the pandemic uh, are, are making their coverage free of charge to anybody in the world. You will see in some of the uh, articles, and I will give you a list of who the best journalists are in the US covering this pandemic um, are, you can go and read their articles. You'll see sources quoted, quoted in those articles. Realize that sources who are being quoted already in the press will maybe be more likely to talk to other journalists. They've decided to make themselves available. It's a place to start. And you will build up your ecosystem of uh, sources, health statisticians, epidemiologists, uh, doctors working in um, emergency settings. You'll, you'll build it up gradually. But so, I'm just mentioned some of the publications I think doing some of the best reporting and it's all uh, for me as a, as a wired journalist, I formerly worked for the Associated Press uh, Dow Jones. These, there are very few publications that we would actually uh, quote in our articles that we knew we could really rely on. These are the ones that we would rely on. The New York Times, The Economist, Washington Post, the Atlantic, which is doing some superb work on the pandemic, The New Yorker. So, you know, you can find some interesting sources on different specific topics on the pandemic um, to get sort of ideas of people who you can, can contact initially. Next slide. And, and this is another, just a, a tip, you know, we always do this in, in the US to build your ecosystem of sources. At the end of an interview with a, with a researcher or a doctor, you could say, 
who else do you think uh, is a good person for, for me to talk to on this topic? Um, you know, and, and what else do you think I should, should know? You know, we are not uh, experts. We are not epidemiologists. We are not bioethicists. What else should I know? You know, what, what other questions do you think I should ask? That's how you continue to build your expertise and build up your potential source base. Uh, you just, sim I simply ask that always at the, at the end of every interview with, with every source. Uh, who else should I speak with? What else should I know? And what other questions should I, should I ask? Three, three or four simple questions. Next slide. And remember um, the rule of threes, you know, uh, don't ever rely on one source for your information. Make sure that at least three people are saying roughly the same thing. It might be a little, this person a little different, this person a little that, but broadly they're in agreement. If you don't have three, Three people that sort of agree this is the way things are headed. I'm not so sure you have a story. Uh, a, single, a one source story for us uh, in the US is, is not a story. We're not even allowed uh, actually to, to publish them. You want to get a range of perspectives, but also people who are kind of saying roughly the same thing before you can have any sort of degree of comfort uh, that, that you're on the right track. Next slide. Um, I would offer this up to you. This comes from, uh, from the days of covering Ebola. Um, Ghana, another country like Nigeria, was very concerned that Ebola could possibly spill over the borders. Uh, journalists realized right away they had limited resources at their disposal. They couldn't be covering uh, Ebola full time. So they decided to create a WhatsApp group and to share their sources that they built up, you know, a doctor in a particular treatment unit, um, a researcher, and they shared it across, uh, uh, across each other. And I think this is something I would ask you um, to think about. Um, it's, it's, it's something we, you know, we are in a crisis and yes, journalism is a very competitive business, but you know, we're in very different territory now when we're talking about something that could have such grave, consequences on, um, on our economies and, and societies going forward. Um, so I would just offer this up to you as something to think about, to do a, as, as a group, to share your sources. Um, it's just something that would be, I think, more efficient. So something to think about. So uh, before we move on to the next segment, we're going to have someone from the Centers for Disease Control in Nigeria, uh, Halafu uh, Usman, is going to be speaking to you. But I'm wondering if you have any questions at all. I could maybe answer uh, one or two questions. Uh, Sarah, it's Russell. Uh, move on to the CD. Yes. Uh, okay. Uh, sorry to interrupt. Uh, before we take on the questions, and we have a really, really large group, so I imagine we're going to have quite a few questions. Um, well, I'm going to ask a question for them. Okay. Okay. One of the best things that I uh, heard in your presentation basically was the fact that uh, reporters are not experts in these fields. Um, and that is not necessarily a bad thing because obviously uh, the public in general is not. Uh, they represent the public. They ask the questions that uh, the layman would ask of these experts if they had the opportunity. But it is important for reporters to educate themselves as best they can on this subject matter. And I think you've recommended that they read a lot um, from other journalists. You mentioned The Economist, you mentioned The Atlantic. I think they also want to look at uh, maybe some of the peer reviewed material. They need to educate themselves and develop a certain level of expertise if they are going to report effectively on this, uh, on this issue or frankly speaking, any other issue. So maybe you wanna speak a bit more about that. Um, and I'm glad that you brought that up, um, Russell, because uh, things have changed a lot in, in medical research during this pandemic. Um, you know, uh, traditionally, everybody relied on peer reviewed research now because there's such an urgency to this um, disease. And I'll provide, I think, a background note um, after this session. Um, it's not just the respected publications like The Lancet that you should look at. And maybe I can give you a list of what those are. 
uh, as an information note to, to study. Um, when we go through health statistics, I'll talk a little bit about the different types of research that is out there. So you understand the difference between a lab story, a lab study and a population study and what we mean by a placebo controlled double blind trial. You need to understand what all that research means to be able to understand the effectiveness and, and what all of these things mean when you start to read the research, which we will go through in the second session. But what started to happen, and it's actually a bit of a concern, because this, this is such a, a global emergency, there's now a website that is putting out any kind of research by anybody. It's not necessarily peer reviewed. Um, and it's a little bit of a problem because it's not really being vetted properly. It's not being peer reviewed. Um, it's raising all kinds of questions, even for respected journalists, on whether or not they should be covering some, it's, it's called BioRIX is the name of this website, uh, whether or not they should be uh, divulging the information which is coming out. And it's just coming out in such a profusion. Um, hundreds, if not thousands of studies are being now posted on this special site. Uh, and one example recently uh, that ha happened two weeks ago was that there was a, uh, a company in Boston called Modena who had done a very small clinical trial of eight people uh, with a particular medication, which showed um, that these eight people showed a great uh, relief in the symptoms of, of COVID. And so the company announced these results. Uh, they they uh, made it available publicly. There was not only a huge uptick in the stock price of the company of Modena, but there was a huge uptick on in global equities markets because it gave people hope that there could be a vaccine waiting in the wings. But the truth of the matter is it was a very small study. It was only on eight people. Uh, that's nowhere near the level of the body of research that you would need to definitively say we've got a vaccine and we can start producing it. So when we talk about uh, health statistics, how to understand research studies, how to un even understand data, what the things, resources that I can give you on your computer and refer to educate yourself on what all these different studies are, how they work, what they Okay. Thank Should we move on? You. Well, let me ask uh, one other question. Um, I see that quite a few companies uh, are regularly issuing uh, press releases, sort of, uh, I guess, teasing uh, the population about the prospect of a vaccine uh, being discovered, being mass produced this year. Um, I noticed that other experts, such as uh, Dr. Fauci and others, uh, suggest that uh, it is probably unlikely that we're going to have a vaccine relatively quickly, but nevertheless, uh, uh, companies are making these, these predictions. Maybe you can describe that the, there is a certain commercial <laughs> interest on the part of uh, companies to make these sort of predictions. Uh, oftentimes, they are publicly traded companies, and there's a, uh, uh, a certain value uh, from the from the standpoint of their stock <laughs> to uh, excite people about the prospect of making a breakthrough. But as you, uh, I think, aptly described, it's important for reporters to be somewhat uh, skeptical, and that skepticism uh, should be conveyed in a professional way uh, in their reporting. Um, maybe you want to speak to that. I think that's a very good example. Let's let's say, for example, we're talking about this uh, Modena press release saying that you know that that quoted the results of their research, you know, in in very good, accurate terms. But you shouldn't just do a story that only tells what the company is telling. I what I would automatically do uh, if I received such a press release is I would make sure that I have on deadline uh, a group of ex all the latest research, this kind of research which is being done on a potential vaccine, who could then give you two or three different views on this research. And then I would also get someone in, a, in an official capacity, a, a medical research capacity, probably with the government and or on an international level like the World Health Organization to also address this issue. So I would have at least three other experts who I would say, well, what do you think of this research? What has to happen next? 
Um, what are the steps that we need to take uh, after this research has been released to verify that this in fact uh, is um, a, a vaccine that, that we can count on? How long will this process take? You need to ask all those questions. Um, and it's interesting what you were saying about uh, Dr. Fauci. It gets interesting how these statements are a little bit. Um, before Modena came out with this uh, press release, which was a couple weeks ago, uh, Dr. Fauci was saying he didn't see us being able to come up with a vaccine in the last 18 months. And that was kind of what he was saying in his health briefings. After this Modena release, he said something ever so slightly different, but you, you really have to pay attention to what he said. He now says that he is cautiously optimistic that we could perhaps come up with a vaccine by the fall. But watch what he's saying, cautiously optimistic. He is in no way saying that he thinks we're going to have a vaccine come the fall, irrespective of whatever claims the company is making. Um, and also, as I said, you really need to understand the critical issues behind creating a vaccine, the tremendous amount of research that has to go into it, the peer reviewing of that research, the um, regulatory approvals, and the type of research that has to go on in order to receive regulatory approval. Even though in this pandemic, and it's something else you need to understand, is uh, in countries like the US and, and elsewhere, they are trying to look at fast tracking approvals, regulatory approvals, fast tracking research. They are changing the methods, but you need to be able also to explain that to your readers uh, in very clear terms. Uh, things have changed in the pandemic. They're using a fast track approval. This is how it works. All with a degree of skepticism because uh, it remains far from clear whether we will ever find a vaccine Again, sophisticated the computer are pain of the coronavirus. Uh, you have to remain carefully reporting on medical issues. Okay. Very As our person on the CDC um, no, appear, we, uh, have not seen a message from him as of yet. So I think it would be wise for us to move on to the next module and then we can save our questions to the conclusion of, of that presentation. Okay. Uh, do you have any questions or shall I move on? I see some of them are coming through. What? It's up to you. I would say you want to. Looks like. Okay, let's move on to the next slide then. Yes, a key role of journalists, not only must we remain quite skeptical and make sure that we have all the evidence from enough sources with a sort of a consensus view. We also are debunkers of myths. Um, this is especially important in this age of, of disinformation. It's an especially important role for uh, medical journalists and, and health journalists. Uh, when I was a uh, reporter covering health in the US, I worked with a very, very good uh, journalist who was with uh, uh, at that point, uh, Newsweek magazine, and she said, this is one of our key roles. We are debunkers of myths. Um, myths are very appealing to people. Um, we tend to jump at them. We're going through a time where people are panicking. Uh, people are afraid of this virus. Uh, people are grabbing at straws. And our job is to debunk the myths as they come up. But there's a bit of a practice behind it uh, that you need to be aware of. Next slide. So um, UNESCO and the World Health Organization, uh, and I'm going to give you resources that they're going to, uh, free resources at your disposal, um, are now saying that we, we don't just have one pandemic, we, are, we have two. Um, UNESCO did a survey a couple of months ago just to see how widespread uh, what they're calling the infodemic or the huge wave of, of fake news is uh, disinformation on uh, COVID-19. And they found that um, of, I think, about 23,000 people they uh, surveyed, um, close to a third of people on social media are aware that they're reading false information about, about the pandemic. Um, 
So that's quite a large number of people who actually realize they're reading false information. Um, and something like two out of five people who pass along information about COVID-19 are passing along um, on to their Facebook new groups or to their WhatsApp groups. Um, and on Twitter alone, something like uh, about 42% of the tweets that you see on COVID-19 are, are not coming from, from people, you know, they're, they're coming from bots, from bot farms and from various actors who are trying to uh, put more and more disinformation out there. Um, and now that many of the social media platforms are saying that they are going to label disinformation with a warning, uh, Facebook is doing that, Google is doing that, uh, Instagram. Um, it, now close to 40% of, the, of the, all the posts on COVID-19 need a warning. That shows you, I think, uh, this, uh, of this infodemic and how widespread it is. Um, and the problem beneath this, uh, unfortunately, is that uh, most people that are reading their information um, on social media platforms are not, they don't know how to actually stand back and be skeptical as, as a journalist would be about this information. They're not skeptical about, well, where is this information actually coming from? What is the source of this information? And what is in the interest of this uh, source to, to put this information out there? Um, they're not, the average person is, you know, not skeptical about the source behind, uh, behind the information. And that's why it's um, so dangerous because Unfortunately, the more people see disinformation of a certain possible cure or treatment or measure to take, um, the more it's out there, the more people will have, a they will have a tendency to believe it. And there are certain strategies behind this disinformation, which are designed um, to get people destabilized in order to believe it, you know, instilling fear or panic, or um, stealing hate, um, or resentment. Um, there are strategies and techniques within the way in which this information is posted designed to get people to drop their guard and, and believe the information uh, that they are passing. Next slide, please. I'm just putting this up here. This is a recent uh, article in Jeune Afrique uh, where they actually went through and talked about what are some of the most common um, disinformation myths about COVID that are circulating in most African countries about how you can, you know, get the disease or or how it's being spread. Um, you know that you can, you know, get COVID-19 through um, through mosquitoes, for example. Um, Different types of um, so-called uh, remedies, you know, like if you take an antibiotic um, or saying that hydroxychloroquine will cure you or prevent you from, uh, from getting a disease. And then some of the stuff is a bit, you know, fantastic also, fantastic remedies like, you know, rub rubbing your body with uh, sesame oil or um, different kinds of um, herbal remedies, uh, which people use as a part of their regular life. But uh, for the moment, uh, because this pandemic is so new, much about them until they're carefully researched in, in uh, medical research settings or you know bathing in child the urine of a child that's another one that is pretty popular or uh, if you if you touch a package coming from China you could get uh, COVID-19 um, another one which uh, is widely been discredited because there are hundreds of children now that are falling ill from the disease thinking that your children are immune to the disease, which uh, is, is not at all clear. Hundreds and hundreds more cases are coming up every week of uh, children who are, who are getting it. Um, also, um, this idea that, uh, that uh, the virus is, is being spread by the big pharmaceutical companies because uh, they're going to make vast profits from, uh, from any potential vaccine. Well, in fact, um, the discussion now today is um, in, in Western countries, developed countries, making, um, making the vaccine available at very low cost, maybe even free. Uh, and the same discussion is going on as well in, uh, in developing countries, making it available free or at very low cost. In fact, um, they're now saying that uh, the pharmaceutical companies may make uh, very little if, or, or no money from, uh, from any potential vaccine. 
Um, of course, the, the idea that COVID-19 is some kind of a biological weapon designed to, um, you know, create a mass, mass deaths in, in African countries is, is another myth that's circulating. Of course, one that's come from the UK, but it is also circulating in, in many African countries is that uh, 5G uh, technology also will, uh, will spread the virus. You could get it through, through using your mobile phone. Um, and then there's various conspiracies also um, saying that, you know, I'm a famous person and people are trying to discredit me by putting out stories that, you know, that I have COVID-19. And there's many um, instances of these famous actors or, or athletes or other famous figures saying that, you know, this is a conspiracy to, to discredit me somehow in the public marketplace of, uh, of social media. Next slide. Um, I thought we could look, uh, if we could, uh, at a, a video. This is a video that comes from public television in the U.S. Uh, that also talks about this uh, tide of uh, misinformation. It turns out that misinformation and conspiracy theories about COVID-19 are rapidly spreading online, creating what public health officials around the world are now calling an infodemic. John Yang charts the dangerous course of falsehoods during this global health crisis. This can help prevent infection of the coronavirus. Around the world, journalists find themselves debunking wild claims, miracle cures, and prevention methods. You need to microwave your mail to kill the COVID-19 virus. Stories on the origins of the virus. Is the Wuhan coronavirus a biological weapon? Was it built in a lab by scientists and unleashed on the masses? Theories about vaccines and billionaire Bill Gates. Claiming that he actually created the virus to trick people into getting microchipped. One particularly persistent falsehood, 5G mobile networks transmit COVID-19. You know when they turn this on, it's going to kill everyone. And that's A woman in Britain called workers killers for laying 5G fiber optic cables. When they turn that switch on, bye-bye mama. Eva! Across the United Kingdom, arsonists have burned cell towers, and the claim has been shared online with millions around the world. The 5G story is complete and utter rubbish. It's nonsense. It's the worst kind of fake news. The reality is that the mobile phone networks are absolutely critical. It's a, a non-stop uh, hurricane of misinformation and disinformation to debunk. Doreen Marchioni is managing editor of Snopes.com. It's a fact-checking website, and it's been inundated with tens of thousands of requests for the truth about coronavirus claims. One of the dumbest that I encountered was uh, if you stick your face in a hot blow uh, hair dryer, hold a hair dryer to your face, you might blow COVID out of your system. Tonic water, if you drink a lot of it, will cure you? No, it, it, it won't. But it's good in gin and tonics. Many experts call this steady stream of false information and conspiracy theories an infodemic. Epidemiologists at the World Health Organization are battling not just the virus, but also bogus claims. A lot of the time they say to me, oh my goodness, I can't believe these people are actually believing this. Um, I can't believe I have to spend time debunking this myth. And we have to look at it from a scientific point of view and have to spend time and resources doing that. At the same time, these are valuable resources could be spent giving and tailoring messages to vulnerable populations. Even President Trump has touted false and in some cases dangerous treatment ideas. Most recently, internal use of ultraviolet light and disinfectant. I see the disinfectant where it knocks it out in a minute, one minute. And is there a way we can do something like that uh, by injection inside or, or almost a cleaning? Last week, the president walked back some of those comments, saying he was being sarcastic and was taken out of context. Hydroxychloroquine. Try it, if you'd like. And since talking about the possible effectiveness of the anti-malaria drug hydroxychloroquine, Mr. Trump's own Food and Drug Administration is cautioned against using the drug for COVID-19 outside a hospital due to potential heart problems. Last month, a man in Arizona died after ingesting an aquarium cleaning chemical he thought was the drug.
And as humans, we are far more likely to remember something frightening. David Robert Grimes is a cancer researcher and author of The Irrational Ape, which looks at how people can be duped. We are very poor at critical thinking. We are very poor at evaluating sources. And that makes us very vulnerable to the sheer amount of disinformation that is spreading online. Christina Tardagila is the associate director of the International Fact-Checking Network, which is leading an alliance of 89 organizations monitoring coronavirus content in more than 70 countries. Like an epidemiologist who watches a virus spread, you watch these hoaxes spread. Right. And they're spreading fast, John. We're getting misinformation from my uncle, from my cousin, and also from uh, the president or from the prime minister or even from bots. So it is the first time that we're hearing so much uh, disinformation all around the planet. That's led to deadly consequences in countries like Brazil, where President Jair Bolsonaro has repeatedly urged citizens to ignore public health warnings. He's compared the virus to a mild flu, even though the nation leads Latin America in confirmed cases and deaths by large margins. And the chaos of the pandemic has opened the door to misinformation techniques similar to Russia's interference in the 2016 U.S. election. We're already seeing evidence of that. Fake Facebook pages run by fake accounts and or fake people that are tr attempting to in some way manipulate either potentially voters or consumers or simply trying to monetize and make money off this crisis. U.S. intelligence agencies now believe that false text messages sent last month to many Americans about a nationwide lockdown were pushed by Chinese operatives aiming to sow discord. And there are the recent nationwide protests of stay-at-home orders that President Trump has at times encouraged. The seemingly organic movement was in fact organized and driven by far-right Facebook groups that have become a hotbed for conspiracy theories. Social media giants including Facebook, Twitter and YouTube have all faced growing criticism about their role in the spread of misinformation. Facebook, which is a funder of the news hour, now alerts users when they interact with false coronavirus content. On another popular platform, Reddit, users have long policed each other to varying degrees of success. Especially as a scientist, the way that I have to verify things has changed entirely. Emerson Ailey Boggs, a virologist by training, moderates Reddit's coronavirus page, which has more than 2 million subscribers. There's a lot of bad science that comes out during outbreaks, and there's a lot of good science that gets misinterpreted and editorialized even when it's reported faithfully in the first place. If I can't prove it, I don't really want to be associated with it, and I don't want to be responsible for now two million people seeing it and taking it as fact. Despite the flood of misinformation during this crisis, scientist David Robert Grimes believes it can be brought under control. We have to remember that social media and the internet, they are new technologies. And we've always had this problem of being bad at identifying sources of information. The internet has massively exacerbated it. But I'm also optimistic that we can all collectively learn how much of a problem this is when we don't check our sources. But for now, misinformation is spreading faster than the virus itself and could be with us long after the pandemic is over. For the PBS NewsHour, I'm John Yang. Such an important report. Thank you, John. Uh, Sarah? Yes. Before you continue, uh, Halu Uzman has now joined us. Right. <laughs> so before he uh, maybe escapes, <laughs> I thought maybe yes, we'd uh, give him an opportunity to say a few words and then right. we'll continue with our discussion about how uh, uh, misinformation, disinformation is such a uh, critical uh, weapon that is being used to uh, unfortunately uh, mislead people. Uh, we've also received a number of questions at this point, I guess people sort of got their juices flowing. So let's uh, let uh, Hailu uh, speak to us. We'll continue with Sarah and I promise we will get to some of these questions. Uh, Hailu, why don't you introduce um, yourself and uh, say a few words. Thank you. Good morning to everyone, and um, I'm happy to have the opportunity 
to say a few words as uh, part of this uh, very important uh, training. And um, so far, it's been uh, quite educative for me. Uh, and I'm sure it's been educative for our other colleagues on the line as well. Thank you very much, uh, Sarah, for this um, resource and uh, materials. Um, so quickly to actually, um, you know, um, reference um, the DCM's uh, Katnin's, um earlier uh, opening remarks. Um, the U.S. government is indeed um, providing support uh, to the government of Nigeria uh, through what we call um, an incident uh, command stru structure, which is uh, mirrored, um, you know, using the uh, emergency operations center. Uh, system here in Nigeria that is used in responding to um, the COVID uh, outbreak. Uh, basically, <clears throat> uh, this uh, incident command structure includes, of course, um, the leadership of um, the embassy both here in Abuja and the consulate in Lagos, as well as uh, colleagues from um, the USCDC, uh, USAID, uh, Walter Reed, and um, other um, agencies that are part of uh, the mission here in Nigeria. Um, so the incident command structure, like I said, uh, which is mirrored over um, the EOC, locally has um, all uh, the pillars. And uh, one of the pillars um, that um, is there is the risk communication and uh, social mobilization uh, pillar. And um, that pillar is um, used to actually support uh, the government of Nigeria to strengthen uh, the risk communication systems. Uh, including um, message development, which uh, of course is um, you know translating uh, the signs into um, pieces of um, communication information um, materials that uh, people could easily uh, relate to, and that hopefully uh, will continue to lead to behavior change. Um, other aspect that uh, we are currently supporting the government of Nigeria includes, um, you know, using a community-based organizations uh, for community engagement and uh, social mobilization. So all of this is uh, being uh, done in conjunction with um, other uh, development partners, uh, government of Nigeria at uh, the center and um, governments at state and even local government levels. Of course, um, a lot of the work that we do uh, eventually ends up uh, in the public domain, um, including uh, the media, which is an important uh, you know, institution in the outbreak. Uh, for those of us who have been um, following um, public health related um, you know, issues over the years, uh, you will recall that um, as part of the global health uh, agenda, um, public health experts have been saying that um, any outbreak anywhere in the world is, you know, just um, 36 hours, in most cases, away from the other country or other countries uh, that could or may be affected. Um, COVID-19 actually brought that reality uh, very clearly, and um, that is where we are right now. And um, as it is, it now becomes a whole of society you know, approach, including the media. So how does um, the work that we do as a part of um, the response, especially from the risk communication pillar perspective relates to the media? Or what do we see as the role of the media in the work that we do? I mean, people who are saddled with uh, the primary responsibility of translating uh, science into communication pieces. And then, um, you know, knowing fully well the strategic role of the media in making sure that um, you know information goes uh, far and wide. We think there's a very um, organic relationship that should actually exist between those who are on the risk communication side and those who are on the you know mass media or even social media uh, side. So basically um, we as risk communicators actually look at um, the role of the media uh, specifically and, um, you know, in, broadly rather, uh, in terms of informing the public, um, educating them. And then um, media equally serves as a very important uh, feedback mechanism. 
um, in terms of you know relating back information coming from uh, the um, grassroots from the community because of the work that you do, because of the you know work that reporters do in getting information from the grassroots. So um, other aspects, uh, of course, include um, you know um, serving as a um, platform and a channel for delivering, preventing, um, protective uh, uh, messaging, uh, which are the risk communication pillars uh, producing uh, every day. Um, when we talk about uh, people washing their hands, when we talk about, you know, people using face masks, we produce all of those materials. But for them to get as far, definitely um, conventional and social media have a very big role to play. Um, we all know that um, the media also serve as some, you know, source of um, uh, information that um you know informs them of, about risk awareness uh, as well as um you know helping the public to to make a sense of you know the outbreak either be like we are in a pandemic right now uh, by bringing into you know perspective um uh, which increases the public knowledge and understanding of what is actually uh, going on. So there are all of these roles that we see of the media playing. Um, I can say um, a lot of it is already being done, but um, we still have room to improve. Only this morning I saw um, the editorial from this day, and I think that is very, very important um, because for the first time, uh, media organizations in Nigeria are beginning to actually take a position. Uh, before now, it has always been uh, just uh, telling us uh, what the government is doing or reporting uh, some of the things that are happening in uh, our communities. But now we are beginning to see the media actually taking a position, talking about, you know, opening religious um, institution being perilous. I think that is important because um, people do listen to the media. Um, of course, we all know that uh, government and sometimes public institutions come with a lot of baggage um, in terms of credibility, but uh, the media is indeed considered as um, credible institutions and organizations. And uh, when they begin to take uh, positions that is informed by science, it really helps the response. So not to, you know, belabor um, the discussion, I'm sure um, a lot of it will be touched on in the course of the training, uh, but this uh, is what we see, uh, the kind of role that we expect the media to continue to play as a part of uh, the whole of society approach that the government of Nigeria is taking, for which the U.S. government is uh, supporting them along the way. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you very much. Very interesting. Um, Russell, do you, at this point, you know, we're kind of towards the end here. Do you think, uh, I think maybe at this point, uh, what would be good is to take a few questions. I want to just say to the participants, we have talked about how widespread disinformation is. I'm going to provide you, I think perhaps we'll move this to the beginning of the second session. The good news is that um, disinformation is being monitored very closely by certain journalism organizations globally and by um, other international organizations. I'm gonna provide you with a toolkit of where you can go when you're trying to fact check one of these uh, pieces of disinformation where you can go first. And if you don't find that it has been fact checked, I'm going to show you a methodology on how you yourself can fact check these claims. Um, so there's, there's a whole suite of, um, of tips that I'm going to give you on how to, how to fact check disinformation. Um, so with that, Russell, should we take, um, take yeah. some questions? Absolutely. Uh, many of the questions sort of relate uh, to the difficulty that journalists here have obtaining information or maybe verifying information. So I'll give you uh, one example. Uh, the question was, how do we deal with the issue of non-availability of data in news reporting? So I think what the reporter is describing is maybe the difficulties um, that he or she may have in obtaining data here. Another one asks, are there any tips for getting around government's refusal to divulge what should normally be public information? So uh, again, uh, this seems to be a consistent theme that uh, it may be difficult to obtain. 
da data is absolutely uh, critical to covering the pandemic story. Um, this is a problem in, in most countries, and it's a, it's a problem that is different in each country. Um, there are other, in the second session, we're gonna talk about health statistics. And I'm gonna provide you with a couple of other platforms that do have information of health statistics on Nigeria that can provide you with perhaps an alternative if you're not getting the information from, uh, from your authorities. Um, it won't be perfect, but at least it will be the best available data that you can get, the most timely data um, from credible sources. Um, I do think uh, what uh, Halilu said is quite interesting, <clears throat> which is that this is a moment in Nigeria where journalists are starting to speak out on their views of how the government is handling the pandemic. To me, if uh, you are not getting timely and credible data on new infections, deaths, hospitalizations, and testing, to me, uh, this is probably a very interesting topic that um, one of you who works for one of the major publications can, should consider perhaps doing an editorial on it because the only way that we are going to be able to manage this pandemic until a vaccine or treatments are found is going to be through um, reading the data, interpreting the data properly, and taking various measures at different points along the way to selectively have to perhaps tighten public health measures in certain areas while keeping them open in others. And obviously, the government needs to inform the public on a fairly regular basis of what the state of the spread of the disease is. This is absolutely um, a critical issue. I, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, concerning the second question about government refusal to divulge public information beyond health data, let's put health data off to the side. We've just talked about that. I'm not exactly sure what specifically you're talking about in terms of public information on the pandemic that you're not getting. Can you perhaps be just a little bit more specific? What is the information, the vital information that you don't think is, is being given by the government? I need to, uh, just a few topic areas of what that information is. Well, Sarah, uh, the, the questioner didn't go into detail as to the specific information, but I would say to sort of put things in the local context here, oftentimes uh, the media has difficulty getting credible information across the spectrum. Um, and so when they have those difficulties, I think uh, these reporters are, are sort of uh, asking for your perspective, your experience in terms of what do you do when uh, the government is uh, uh, resistant to providing information, any type of information. Now related to that, uh, another uh, question that seems to be consistently coming up is just the public skepticism about government information, period. Okay. Um, some suggest that the, uh, the public believes that the pandemic doesn't exist. It's an opportunity for the government to get more aid from donors or uh, other governments. Um, there is the belief that the public can't believe what the government says. So in that case, what can a journalist do? Uh, once again, I guess I need some more specifics before I can kind of address this in any really um, meaningful way. Maybe we'll come up with an example. Um, in, in many, many governments and in, in many countries, governments are, let's say, spinning the data. Um, I heard this the other day in a session um, in Cameroon where the government wanted to emphasize the number of people who were recovering from COVID as opposed to talking about how many new infections the country had um, of, of COVID. Uh, so they were sort of spinning the information, um, which is, I think, um, justifiable. Uh, in this case, um, the best that you can do <clears throat> as a journalist, and let's talk about health data just for the moment here, um, is to do your, the best job that you can to find those um, organizations that are collecting the data uh, in a, that are doing it according to best practices on a regional or local level uh, or at national level. Um, report on it as often as you get it. Um, 
if the government is starting to make misstatements about that data, then I think you need to state that. Uh, if they are, in this case, you know, perhaps not reporting on deaths, then I think you need to say that we haven't had any information on the number of new deaths in our country for six weeks or eight weeks. We need this information. Um, so I think you can point out in your reporting that this information is lacking and that we, we need this information to really begin to divulge to the public exactly what is happening in the spread of this disease. The issue of data is a very important issue. Uh, it's been an issue in the United States as well, uh, where, where journalists actually have formed, and I'm gonna talk about this in the next session on health statistics. Um, journalists have come together, more than 500 journalists, to, get, um, to do their own data collection <clears throat> by relying on regional, in that case, uh, state and local authorities, to get the information collected faster because there was a long lag time in the information which passes from the local level to the national level before it's reported by the CDC in the US. They have formed a whole tracking project to track what's happening in every state. It's a, a very large project, which I'll tell you a little about next time. <clears throat> so the best that you can do is find out who is collecting the data according to the way that it should be collected that you can report on. It might be on a local or a regional level and to hold the government accountable if there is a very large lag in reporting the data. Realize that the best practices should be uh, reporting on a daily basis, uh, numbers of new infections, numbers of people um, admitted to hospitals who are currently in critical care, numbers of deaths, number of report, you know, there's a certain number of statistics that should be reported daily. That doesn't happen in every country. It doesn't necessarily have to be reported daily, but what does matter is that it's reported in a meaningful time frame to give uh, citizens an idea of what is happening for the spread of the disease, which should be over, the, over a period of at least a week to two weeks, because most health statisticians do not give information on public health measures until they've seen a trend line. And a trend line is not what happens every day, it's what happens over a meaningful period of time. Okay, thank you, Does Sarah. that help? I think it does. Uh, if I can offer a little perspective on the, the questions about the skepticism uh, relating to government uh, provided information. Um, I think what reporters are trying to convey to you is that oftentimes uh, the government here doesn't feel compelled to be totally honest with uh, uh, the media or the public as a whole. Okay. Um, I think most journalists will probably agree with that statement. <laughs> uh, so if the public is rightfully skeptical of uh, what they hear oftentimes from the government, um, when the government is now trying to provide very, very useful, needed information, there's a disconnect. What can right. the media do? Well, the media in many respects is not compelled to work on behalf of the government, but the, gov but the media is uh, hopefully uh, compelled to work on behalf of the public. <clears throat> media wants to verify as best it can what the government is saying about this particular issue or any other issue. I think you answered it well during the course of your presentation. It's the need to obtain multiple sources of information. Yes. Oftentimes, for better or for worse, uh, international sources may be more credible than the government. So if you are obtaining that information from a variety of sources, international as well as local, government and non-government, government and academic sources, and they are basically concluding the same thing about the uh, danger of this pandemic, then hopefully <laughs> that should convince the media and hopefully they can then pass that along to the public in order to alleviate what skepticism they may have. We're not suggesting that you're going to eliminate skepticism, but hopefully they will mitigate that skepticism and hopefully the public will be more willing to believe uh, what is necessary to be done in order to increase their health. I think that's a very interesting point, Russell. And I think that what a journalist could do when we're talking about the government's management of this pandemic 
is make it a strategy, a concerted reporting strategy. If you have a list of international sources at the World Health Organization, uh, CDC Africa, and other international organizations, so that in any one article, when you're quoting what the government is saying, you're also quoting at least two other, or maybe even three international sources that are broadly saying the same thing. I think that could just be a part of your regular reporting strategy on this pandemic. I think that's something that you just need to factor into the way in which you in which you report. Thank you. Uh, another okay. question that has come up, and I guess it's similar to what we saw in the uh, video by a uh, public broadcaster. Uh, it asks, how do we debunk the opinion by some Nigerians that COVID-19 is a bioweapon by the Chinese to curtail America? Um, we're going to talk in the second se session about how you de debunk disinformation, when you debunk it, and how you debunk it. Um, so in the second session, I'm going to give you some of the strategies for that. I think what you saw in the PBS video is actually one of the strategies that you can use, which is that you go out once again and you get uh, experts to actually c come out and say this is, you know, complete nonsense. There is no bioterrorist weapon. Find those international experts who could be disinformation experts, as you saw. is to come out and, and say that and put that in your in your article that's one of the ways in which you can address that let me look for another question i see many of them are asking uh, very very similar questions okay okay Yeah, they're all about hiding information, uh, the government's unwillingness to provide information. All right, this is a different question. Um, how do we keep from getting sucked in emotionally, particularly when we have first have seen firsthand the devastating impact of the pandemic? Uh, what do you mean by sucked in emotionally? Uh, I mean, I. I think you can't help but have a, a very strong emotional response to the, the tragedy of uh, the people who have uh, taken very ill from this, uh, from this disease and, and, and died from it. And in fact, one of our roles is actually uh, to report on this um, in a strategy to have our communities continue to feel compassion and understand that this pandemic is indeed very real, and I can sure share with you, I think uh, in the third session, what I think are some very interesting examples of uh, reporters who have done just that. Um, I think actually it is our role uh, to show the depth of detail of uh, how people have fallen so tragically ill from, from this disease. I think that's actually one of our roles, uh, to elicit an emotional response, and it's also one of the ways to try and lower the barriers because uh, of people who don't believe uh, that this pandemic is real. If they are faced with the incontrovertible evidence of lives that have been lost, individual lives, and the tragedy of the individual experiences, um, it's very difficult to say that, that this is a hoax and that this isn't real. So I actually think that's one of our key roles in this pandemic, to do the kinds of human stories. That's why cultivating sources of doctors and nurses who can either set you up with interviews with doctors and nurses who fell ill and recovered, or with patients that fell ill and recovered, or with families of people who lost lives from COVID is absolutely a very important element to the reporting that we do on the pandemic. <clears throat> Thank you, actually, I think that was a great answer if I do say so myself. Uh, another issue that comes up here uh, in Nigeria and probably elsewhere in Africa is the role of alternative medicines or maybe traditional um, medicines. Uh, we've described the fact that uh, it may be quite some time before a vaccine is developed. And so uh, I think it's sort of natural uh, for people to want to pursue alternatives. Uh, one of the alternatives 
that has been uh, frequently mentioned is uh, this uh, herbal uh, drug um, uh, that Madagascar, uh, for instance, is pushing. I'm sure that's not the only one. Um, and certainly in Nigeria, there's a lot of interest and maybe there's a, a herbal cure, a traditional uh, medication that uh, can be utilized to cure people from, uh, from, the, from the pandemic. Uh, what is the role of uh, media in terms of evaluating these claims um, for their veracity? That's an excellent question because I think it's a very important uh, part of the pandemic story in, in Nigeria and many African countries, which is what the country is doing to try to find, you know, very affordable, easily, easily acceptable um, treatments. Uh, they may not be cures, but they could perhaps alleviate symptoms. But this actually is, should be part of the inquiry that's going on. Having said that, and actually I've prepared a best practices example on how to handle these phytotherapy solutions, which are coming up in Madagascar and Cameroon and in many other countries. Um, and I'm going to show you, the, show you this example in the next session, uh, which is, I think, a best practices example. The, the message I want to leave you with is that no matter what the possible uh, treatments or cures are, we as journalists have a responsibility to convey to our readers and our listeners uh, where, what is the medical evidence, uh, whether or not this particular plant or herb uh, is effective at all. Uh, in helping people who fall ill from, from COVID. We have to stick to the science. We have to find out, and I have to say that because again, this is a brand new disease that the world about this particular coronavirus, um, chances are it's not been studied what a particular plant or herb could do to actually help alleviate symptoms or be any part of the solution, but we have to lay out um, what will be done by different government research institutes uh, to actually study a particular plant or herb. What do we know? What don't we know? And what's going to be done? And what I'm going to show you, if you want, uh, the beginning of the second session is an example of a report by Reuters. And what I think is a best practices example of how you actually report on th phytotherapy right now to show people that, uh, you know, this looks interesting, but these are the steps that need to be taken on the part of Madagascar uh, and research institutions in Africa to verify whether or not this particular herbal um, plant will be um, something that can be a part of the solution. It has to be a part of our reporting, but we have to stick to the science. We have to stick to the evidence of what we have. So I will show this in, in an example in the next session. Thank you. Here's another uh, somewhat different question. Um, you will recall that, uh, I think it was maybe a week or so ago, the New York Times on the uh, front pages uh, carried the names of, I think it was thousands of Americans. Thousand. Right, well, yeah. thousands, plural, <laughs> who have uh, yeah. died from the, uh, the, the pandemic. Um, usually, um, um, the news media is a bit reluctant um, to show the names of uh, of individuals uh, with, unless they've received uh, permission ahead of time. And so this reporter is, I think, asking about the strategy of, uh, of revealing those names. Um, it may relate to the, the need, as you described earlier, to personalize uh, the effects of the pandemic. But the, uh, again, the reporter is uh, curious about uh, why that's done and how that's done. Of course, this gets into the differences between publicly available information in Nigeria, as well as cultural sensitivities in Nigeria versus the United States. Um, in the United States, when somebody dies in a community, typically um, there is a death notice, which is published in the local newspaper with the name of the person and whatever details the family wants to divulge. It's a matter of public record. Uh, so for the New York Times to do that piece, they can then go and, as a matter of public record, look at the newspapers that, uh, and get those names because usually in a death notice, certain data is in there, such as the age of the person, um, you know, death notice that because it's in the public domain, 
do that in um, the new available information and information. I want to take it a step further. Actually, also as a part of this, provide you with the link to the podcast that the New York Times did um, on those 100,000 tributes that I have seen to the people who lost their lives uh, to this pandemic. Um, the New York Times has a daily podcast. It's called The Daily, where they did um, brief anecdotes of some of the people who had been written about in the local press. Um, you know, just interesting human details about this person loved to roller skate and this person, you know, loved to salsa dance. And, and they, they split it into three parts, which I thought was quite interesting. They told these beautiful stories. Again, they came from local newspaper reports. So they relied on local newspaper reports for their information. They told beautiful, very brief human stories that profiled uh, the lives of 100 people who died of the pandemic. Personal stories, one third of the podcast was devoted to details of how people fell ill, and one third of it referred to details of um, you know, funeral memories or, or memories from the family. And I'm gonna share that with you. I think you'd find it very interesting to listen to, but all this information was publicly available. The only thing I could probably say to you in Nigeria is get their permission. I have covered sensitive topics as a reporter in the US. I used to cover drug murders that used to take place uh, in, in New York. And I used to have to go and interview the families after a son died in a, in a drug shooting, for example. And of course, I had to call the family and I said, you know, would you be willing to talk about this? Would you be willing to share your story? Some people would be willing and some people would not. Some people understood that perhaps if they could tell the story of the loss of their son, that somehow this would instill in others uh, a certain level of humanity and understanding. But it depends on whether or not the family would like to talk about uh, the loss of somebody. Um, Perhaps there's a way to do it uh, by divulging some details without maybe divulging others. Um, it's a delicate balance, but you have to get, I think, every time you have to get the permission of the individuals to, to write about them if the information is not publicly available. So I think we've gone on a little bit longer, Russell. Yes, I think it's- That's okay. That's okay. Shall we take this up? Uh, if there are other remaining questions, I'm happy to answer them. Russell, if you want to gather them together, I'm happy to answer them either in like a written email that can be uh, made available to the participants if you would like. If some of them fall into certain categories and you'd like me perhaps to touch on them briefly in the next session, I'm happy to do that as well. So Thank you. Yes, it is time to wrap up. I think, yes, we'll uh, sort of take a look at these questions. We'll hopefully bunch them together into some common themes. We'll pass them on to you and then we'll uh, try to address them as best we can, either at the top of the next session or maybe uh, if we have this WhatsApp group or whatever, we can share it that way uh, with the uh, participants. But as we come to a conclusion for today's session, once again, I wanna thank uh, Sarah. I wanna thank our, our DCM for speaking to us. I wanna thank Hadalu Usman from the US CDC <laughs> for participating in today's program. Uh, the next session will take place on the 8th at the same time. Uh, Sarah will continue uh, her presentation and uh, offer us some uh, new insights on how to best cover COVID-19. So let me thank everyone for uh, contributing to a very, very enlightening program today. And I hope to see you and hear from you all again on June the 8th. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Till next time.